Hello, my name is Hugh Jones and I work for Cambridge University Digital Library, which is Cambridge University's unified platform for the digital humanities. It's a big website um, displaying high resolution images of our collections alongside and linked with description, transcription, etc. Um, lots of metadata. 25,000 items online so far, but we've got over 3 million special collections items, so we've still got some way to go um, and some things to do. Um, so there's lots of material on the site, which is a big investment, so discovery of that material, the uh, benefits of the investment is very important to us. And I've been asked to talk to you about one particular aspect of discovery, which is engaging with academic researchers and the big effect it can have on the discovery and use of your material. The particular project I'm going to talk about is the Board of Longitude, but it's just one very good example. The same is true of nearly all of our digital library projects. So, the Board of Longitude was a two-year project to digitise, describe and put online the complete archive of the Board of Longitude. It was a partnership with an existing AHRC-funded research project based at HBS in Cambridge and the National Maritime Museum. It was a very big project, um, the biggest ever undertaken by the University Library. Um, the outputs were 65,000 images, very high-resolution images, 100,000 words, over 1,000 pages of transcription, over 100 detailed archival records, and then school resources, contextual essays, three short films, and a conference, which is also films and reports. It involved more than 15 people um, in the core team. Over three years, um, lots of organisation went into it. And it was a big success. Um, quoting from our report, since launch in July 2013, the Longitude Collection on Cambridge Digital Library has attracted more than 70,000 visitors from all over the world, with a further 10,000 views of our specially commissioned short films on YouTube. Social media fe feedback points to the breadth of the online audience, from academic researchers through to family historians and students. There has been ongoing media interest in the online collection, which has been featured by the BBC, Times, Guardian, Telegraph, amongst others, and also highlighted on the popular BBC programme Coast. The collection also achieved a very high profile in the university and appeared on the front page of last year's annual report. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, so the root of that success and the ongoing success of the uh, collection was close engagement throughout the project with academic researchers studying the material. So, just to give you some context, here's um, an item from the collection. Um, the Board of Longitude was set up by an Act of Parliament in 1714 to solve the problem of establishing longitude at sea. Offered a £20,000 reward, approximately £1.5 in today's money, I'm told, um, for the solution to this problem. Um, it ran for 114 years until 1828 when it was abolished by the government as part of a cost-cutting exercise. And over the course of that 114 years, they threw nothing away, and that is what forms the basis of the archive. Um, it's one of the most important archives for the study of history of science in the 18th century. It has some famous names and some famous stories. So John Harrison, his nemesis, Neville Maskelyne, if you believe the uh, best-selling book, Isaac Newton and Captain Cook, Bly and the Mutiny on the Bounty, Flanders and the Name of Australia. But equally, there are many untold stories and about people about whom we know nothing else. And it tells the story of scientific endeavour, both rational and irrational, voyages of discovery and first contact between European and Pacific cultures, a vast incoming correspondence giving an amazing insight into life in the 18th century. And here's an image from the collection, Norfolk Islands, discovered by Captain Cook in the resolution. And you can see the uh, chart, the course of the resolution sketched on the map. Um, and I'm just going to page through some of the items in the collection. The sketch of a chief of Ohitahu. Show you the breadth um, of the collection, the variety of the material. So here's a letter from William Bly, apologising somewhat passive aggressively for the loss of his timekeeper, mutiny on the bounty, and a picture of a sea lion hunt drawn by William Gooch, um, a astronomer who died tragically young on the island of Hawaii. And here's a rather strange invention. Um, one of many strange inventions, which was a sentence to the board or idea for an invention. And here is a, a story 
um, written by William Gooch about how a cat got into his cabin and destroyed one of his valuable timekeepers. Um, again, William Gooch, in a moment of boredom, listing every single thing in his cabin. Okay, so that's the, the kind of material that we, we have in the, uh, in the collection. And here is a kind of demonstration of the work we've done in terms of just discovering that material. So if you Google Board of Longitude, top hit is actually the primary resource at the archive. Um, again, you can either go in the collection level or you can go to specific items. So if you Google Captain Cook logbook, which you can imagine um, be quite a common search term for people interested. Again, with the first item um, on the results. And then if you click on that, you're straight into, so you go straight from Google, one click straight into the item itself. You can see very large, high resolution zoom images on the left. And then on the right hand side, and this is the academic contribution, very detailed um, description, research outputs about the material closely linked with the material itself. So where you can see the blue, that's a link which will bring up the page described. I just click through to show you the, uh, the resolution of the images. So in we go, in we go again, and there we go. So extraordinarily high resolution images. Um, one of the, the things which the academics told us was actually you could see more on the images than you could on the uh, physical material itself. And then back, and you can see at the bottom there, on the right-hand side, um, the academic in question, Owen Phillips here, has actually put his name to his contribution. So in the sense, it's publication, much like in um, an article or a monograph. And here are some of the people involved in the project, from photographers through to academics, through to archivists. Okay, so as I said, the key to the success of the project was how closely we work with the researchers from the very start of the project, from conception through to planning, through to the work itself, and the dissemination. In terms of direct contribution, the researchers made a massive material contribution to the site, published over 100,000 words of research output to the site under their own names, as we've seen, therefore citable, proper academic publication, a thousand pages of transcription, research outputs published alongside the primary source, um, which is a very, very powerful model for, um, for displaying um, this kind of material. So you have the, the thing itself, and then you have the research outputs all together on one page. And they also contributed to the design of the site, and it's extremely useful um, to have the major users of the material as co-designers for the site for displaying the material. Um, so they contributed ideas which have been now been rolled out across the whole of the digital library, um, such as a thumbnail view, for instance, to be able to allow you to scan very quickly through a document to pick out things like maps, etc., and a variety of other other things came from them. And as well as this direct contribution, there's something else going on, something much more important to us, which was that our relationship with the researchers gave us a direct link into the academic network and activity surrounding the material. That's research and teaching and learning. And this factor versus the kind of high spike in numbers we get um, with a media splash, this, this other factor is the most important thing in ongoing use of the site and in that kind of deep use of the site over a long time to produce things like articles, monographs. So put simply, um, because the researchers have contributed to the site, they have a sense of ownership of the site, they trust the material on the site because they themselves have worked on it and they know it very well, so you have trust. Um, because they themselves are high profile and trusted figures in the area, so the academic networks they operate in also grow to trust the site and communicate that trust to others. So you get this kind of spread of um, both knowledge of the site and trust of the site through an academic network. That means that um, the site features heavily in trusted sources, so articles, monographs, mentioned in conferences, blogs, um, the Wikipedia. So you get these kind of um, spreads out and starts to become apparent um, in the literature and on the web. And as the interest in the site continues to grow, it continues to attract attention because of the ongoing momentum generated by the research community. 
So this gives you advocacy for the site and for the library service more broadly in the academic community and therefore generates new partnerships and new projects. So because of the success of the Board of Longitude project, we've had lots and lots of people approaching us, um, academics approaching us, saying I'd like to do something similar, which is great for us. Um, the figures indicate that yes, there are a lot of people on the site, but this particular material gets a different kind of use. Um, we see people spending a long time on the site and navigating through the site, not that kind of one hit in and out that you tend to get from media coverage. Um, plus the patterns indicate that it's being used in teaching, so some pages are used intensively for short periods where the essays are set or class is looking at it. And the site is very heavily cited across the literature. Um, so this kind of engagement is very important to discoverability and use, and the libraries cannot do this on their own. So the problem of how to engage with academic networks is a massive problem in the digital humanities. Um, essentially, the digital humanities projects, they usually, um, for a number of years, they're kind of short time periods. And the big problem for them is how to secure the longevity of the outputs. Um, so this is of concern to researchers, but also to funders. And the library can position itself to solve this fundamental problem. Um, if you let research projects know that the library provides a service, the library can pr provide a stable platform and longevity for their research outputs, then that's a very attractive proposition for, um, for people, digital humanists or, or researchers looking for funding collaborations. Libraries can do things that research projects can't. The library has a long-term commitment to the preservation and display of digitized material, and it's institutionally geared towards stable, long-term, being providing stable, long-term platforms for digitized material. And then another big problem which um, research projects have is impact, which of course is becoming very important both in securing funding and in the REF, etc. So funders demand demonstrations of impact, and putting their research outputs online for free so everyone can see them, not just publishing to a kind of small group um, through articles or through um, monographs. Um, for, so everyone can see it is a fantastic um, thing for impact. Um, and the uh, research project on the um, Board of Longitude project were extremely um, happy to get the very high use figures um, of, of the site. Um, which they could then put in their report and that, you know, that satisfies the funder and perhaps makes them keen to fund more in the future. So I think that by positioning, by, by making the argument to research projects that you can, you can really give them a valuable, be a valuable partner and do things, you know, fill those gaps which research projects on their own around longevity and around impact and sustainability, which research projects on their own have struggled with in the past. Um, and also if you get an established system in place for costing the service which you can offer, you can offer a well-costed service to academics which offers that sustainability and impact. And then the very nature of today's funding model will make that very attractive indeed to them. Um, and then just a few extra things. Um, if you use tools and standards which will adequately represent the research output, um, so the one thing which uh, researchers and libraries have struggled with in, in the past is that when the um, when researchers want to contribute towards to, towards kind of what's seen as library sites, the metadata standards haven't been able to take in the richness of the research output, and that's now changing. So if you think about something like TEI against um, a MARC record, the T MARC is very limited and much more for library information, but TEI can act as a basis for collaborative work between researchers and libraries because it can also take in that kind of rich research material. Also, if you make your site citable, both technically in terms of URL construction, but also in terms of encouraging researchers to put their names and a date to their contributions, then you're making it easy for academics to use your site to, in the way that they're, they're used to, so citing it in articles, including in bibliographies. And you're also giving the academics who are contributing that kind of that prestige of um, publication, not just kind of... Um, contributing anonymously to something fairly thin. 
and um, be open to cross-institutional and cross-sector collaboration. Um, libraries sometimes struggle with this, but it's normal in acad academia, and if you are open to it, then you'll make yourself much more attractive um, to research projects as a potential partner. Um, and lastly, um, start. But what we've learnt is that if you start with your very high-profile material to get the attention of the media and also your own institution, then that gives you that initial buzz around the collection, and then people start to approach you and say, "I'd like to do the same thing," and then one thing will lead to another. Okay, and that's it from me. And I hope you found that interesting. And that's me, my work uniform, and my contact details. So thank you very much.